OK, um, I want to talk to you about strong logic for weak memory um, and how to reason about release acquire consistency in Iris. And this is joint work with Hi, Derek, Ori, and Victor, who are all here. Now, the title contains some words that you might not be familiar with, such as weak memory, release acquire, and Iris. So I'll start by explaining these one by one. Weak memory. So weak memory is when different threads observe memory events in different order. Let's make this a bit more concrete with an example. We're looking here at the so-called store buffering example. We have two shared variables, x and y, which are both initially zero. And we have two threads. The first thread will write to x and read the contents of y into a local variable a. The other thread will write to y and read the contents of x into a local variable b. The question is, is a equal to b equal to zero a valid outcome of this program? And if you think about interleavings, you might say, that's impossible. And in fact, this behavior is forbidden in sequentially consistent models. However, in almost all weak memory models, this behavior is in fact allowed. And the reason is that the threads may simply not observe the other threads right event. Now, why do we care about weak memory? Uh, in fact, weak memory is everywhere. All multi-core hardware exhibits these weak memory behaviors. And preserving the, the fiction of sequentially consistent, of a sequentially consistent memory model is very expensive. And of course, programmers don't like that. So now, in modern languages, you can use these weaker accesses to get the, the maximum performance out of your multi-core hardware. And for example, the C, C++ languages, and Java have these accesses. Uh, our work focuses on the C, C++11 memory model. Now, what's that? The C11 memory model, as I will call it from now on, consists of two parts. First, we have non-atomic accesses. These are what you would call normal, like, kind of traditional data accesses. And they are not thread safe. If you race on these accesses, you get undefined behavior. The second part are the atomic accesses. These are thread safe, and they're, they're okay to race on. And these range from the uh, very performant, but barely synchronizing relaxed accesses, all the way to the very expensive and strongly synchronizing sequentially consistent accesses. And we focus specifically on the so-called release acquire fragment, which sits firmly in the middle between these two extremes. It's cheaper to implement than sequentially consistent accesses, but still supports very useful synchronization patterns, uh, like the so-called message passing idiom. And this is what we look at next. So message passing. The message passing idiom is a pattern that is used to communicate values from one thread to another. And I've put here some uh, incomplete code, a kind of naive version of how you would uh, attempt this, by using two, by using, uh, first of all, a shared variable x to communicate the message, um, perf then performing a non-atomic write to x in the first thread, setting it to 37, which is the message we want to communicate, and then reading non-atomically in the second thread. And of course, the hope is that we would get the value 37 out, but uh, the way the example is now, this is not going to happen. There are two problems. First of all, we have no guarantee that the second thread will read the write of the first thread and not the initialization write. But even worse, because these two accesses are racing, we have no guarantee about any behavior whatsoever. This is undefined behavior. Now, release acquire helps with this in the following way. We will introduce uh, another shared variable, y, which we'll call a flag, a synchronization variable. And when the first thread has um, finished its non-atomic write, it will signal the second thread that it's now OK to read from this variable. It does so with a so-called release write. The second thread, meanwhile, just sits there spinning, uh, performing so-called acquire reads until it sees a non-zero value. Once that happens, the combination of uh, release write and acquire read will achieve synchronization between the two threads. The second thread will synchronize with the first thread. And this guarantees two things. First, it will guarantee that this non-atomic read in the second thread will happen after the non-atomic non -atomic write in the first thread, um, and thereby uh, eliminating the, the, the race that we had before. And it will also guarantee that we see the correct value here, 37, in thread two. OK, so now that we, that we have an intuition, um, we might ask, how can we formally reason about programs that use these, this release acquire fragment and non-atomics? And we're not the first to ask this question. 
there are two major program logics, uh, so what the, the ISL and the GPS logics, um, which have tackled this particular fragment of C11, and they've been used to uh, verify a variety of programs, but there's a problem. These logics are based on the axiomatic semantics which define the C11 memory model. And because of that, their soundness proofs are very complex and involved. Um, they were unable to use all the existing machinery that we have, the standard techniques for proving concurrent separation logic sound. And because of that, it was very difficult to add standard features. For example, ghost state, which is a standard feature in, in separation logics, uh, was missing from ISL, and it was a major advance in GPS that it had any ghost state at all. Um, additionally, it is really hard to extend these logics with new proof rules. Uh, it is also unclear if they can be adapted to other memory models, and um, we also don't know if, these, uh, if, if the reasoning principles of these logics can safely be composed in one proof. And finally, none of these logics offer any support for mechanized verification of programs. Now, the way we want to tackle this, these, these particular problems, is uh, by using IRIS. Now, what is IRIS? IRIS is a framework to develop advanced separation logics and use them for, ver to, for verifying programs in COG. But this doesn't immediately solve our problem. There's a new problem, which is that IRIS itself assumes interleaving semantics. And I mentioned before that C11 only gives us these so-called axiomatic semantics. So if we want to use IRIS with the C11 uh, release acquire an anatomic fragment, we have to first come up with interleaving semantics for that. And that's exactly what we do. So we, de we develop interleaving semantics for C11 release acquire non-atomics, and then derive and even extend the existing program logics ISL and GPS in IRIS. By doing that, we obtain two new program logics, which we call IRSL and I IGPS. And let's see how these program logics address the four problems that I mentioned earlier. First of all, they have much simpler soundness proofs. Uh, these soundness proofs are now just standard separation, sorry, standard separation logic proofs that we do in IRIS. And because of that, we ad inherit advanced separation logic features directly from IRIS for free, such as higher order ghost state. Additionally, these logics now use a, a unified common base logic, which makes them very easy to extend and they're perfectly safe to combine. These proofs of these logics can now be composed. And finally, we, for the first time now, we can support mechanized proofs, uh, mechanized verification of programs by using the IRIS proof mode. All right, now that I've told you about all the advantages of this approach, let's see how we did it. This is a kind of a rough overview of our project. We, we take the operational semantics that I mentioned, we plug them into IRIS, derive a base logic, and then on top of that, derive RSL and GPS. So let's, let's start by looking at the operational semantics. Uh, and before that, we go back to the message passing example that we've seen earlier. So the operational semantics um, has two, two key components. So here I forwarded the execution until after the initialization writes. And we can see the first component here, which is the uh, a set of, of write events for every location, every shared location. And uh, here we see the initial write events y, uh, sorry, 0 for x and y. Now the second key component of the operational semantics are the so-called views of the threads. Uh, a, view, a, a view assigns every location, sorry, a, a view points to the most recent write event that a particular thread has seen for every location in the heap. And in this case, since uh, both threads were started after the initialization writes, they both agree that their views both agree on X and Y. This is the only event they have seen, and the most recent one as well. Now, when we start executing in the first thread, uh, we will simply, by doing this, this non-atomic write, we will simply add a new write event to this, this uh, set of write events with the value 37, and we will update the thread's view accordingly. It, it will always observe its own write. Uh, when we then perform the release write to Y, something interesting happens. We'll add a new write event, but we will uh, additionally record in it the thread's view at the time of the write. So you will see that this, this squiggly line here 
corresponds exactly to the new view of thread one. And we will later use this view to, to achieve synchronization. Okay, so this leaves us with this state. Now, the second thread can finally make progress. There's a, a non-zero write event available. And if it does, um, it will find this, this message with the view contained in it, and it will acquire this view, which means it will join its own view with the view contained in the message. And this will leave it with the, the same view as the first thread. Now, the, the next feature of the operation of semantics is that when we read from a location, we will only consider write events that are to the right or exactly on our view. In this case, this leaves the second thread with the only option of reading the value we want, 37 for max. And therefore, we can show that this program does exactly what we want it to do. Now, okay, let's look at our roadmap again. Uh, we have these operational semantics. Uh, what we'll do is we'll plug them into Iris. So Iris is parameterized by, by these operational semantics. Uh, once we plug them in, we'll get a sort of very thin layer, a, a logical reflection of the operational semantics in a sense, uh, which are not good enough really to derive our, our uh, higher level logic. So we'll first derive this so-called base logic. And the base logic is actually quite simple. There are two, two key components to it. The first one is ownership of a location, uh, which in this case also means owning all its existing rights. So this is, very, this is in some sense similar to the standard points to assertion that, that you probably know from uh, standard separation logic. But instead of just having a, a location at a particular value, we have to remember all these write events because they might still be relevant for other threads. They might still be observed. So this hist assertion up there is simply own, owning a location and its, and its events, and its uh, write events. Uh, additionally, we have another assertion that simply connects a particular thread ID to its view. With these two assertions, we can already derive uh, very expressive rules that nicely reflect the operational semantics. So for example, here, I'm showing you the rule for atomic reads in the base logic. And uh, in the precondition, we simply assert that uh, our thread has some view, and uh, we own the location L with its entire history. When we now read from it, we are guaranteed to find a particular write event in the history, and uh, this write event will have as a value exactly the value we are reading, and its timestamp is gonna be bigger than our view at that particular location. So we're reading only, only from the right. Uh, it, it, we will then achieve this, this synchronization by simply uh, updating our own thread's view with the view we found in the right event. We are acquiring this view. Uh, and finally, we, we still own the location and the history remains unchanged because we haven't added any right events. So, yeah. Um, now, the good news is that the, these, these very simple rules are already good enough to prove the message passing, passing example correct in the base logic. Uh, and I'm, I'm showing you here the proof, you don't need to read it. Um, what I want to highlight is that even though the, these proofs work and, and they're simple reasoning, um, they have all these explicit views. Right? And, and we don't want to reason about these views. They are in some sense just clutter. This, this brings me to the, the next chapter of the talk, which is the high-level logics that we want to encode. And I'm, I'm gonna start by, uh, for, for reasons of time, by introducing RSL here. So RSL is really um, a logic for message passing and release acquire. Um, and so the way it works is uh, by imposing a single location invariant, which we usually call Q, and it's just a predicate on values. RSL has two, two major components, um, two major assertions. The first one is the so-called release assertion, which is indexed by the location and this invariant. And it represents the permission to write to the location. Uh, conversely, we have the acquire assertion, which represents the permission to read from the location. And let's, let's look at the proof rules to, to see how it actually works. So when we want to perform a write event here, we need, of course, the permission to write, but additionally, we need to give up ownership of this invariant. We need to, uh, of, of the invariant Q at the value V that we're writing. And on the other hand, when we read, uh, we need the permission to read, and we're gonna get out the invariant for exactly the value that we're reading. We're gonna get, Q, we're gonna get, get out Q of A, where A is the value that we're reading. Uh, and additionally, um, we're not gonna receive the same ownership again. We have to update the, the invariant here. Now, let's, let's see how we can use this to 
give a nicer proof of the message passing example. So the first thing we have to do is we have to come up with this, this single location invariant Q, right? Uh, in our case, it's going to be really simple. Um, initially, when the value is zero, we demand nothing. It's trivially satisfiable. Uh, once we set the value to one, we will demand ownership of the assertion X at the, the value that we later want to read. Uh, in all other cases, which are not going to happen in this proof, the invariant is not going to be satisfiable. Now, we start the proof by um, giving ownership to, uh, sorry, giving the permission to write to Y to the first thread in addition to ownership of the non-atomic location X. So it's going to uh, perform its non-atomic uh, write. It's fine updating the, the, the value here. Now, let's look at the proof rule for writing again. Um, it says here we need the permission to write, and yes, we have that, and we need the invariant at the value we're writing. Let's see, yes, we do in fact have that. So we can now safely perform the write, and we're just going to drop the permission to, to write uh, afterwards. Um, now let's look at the second thread. The second thread will have the permission to read from Y, and it will do so over and over again until it finally finds a non-zero value. And in this case, let's look at the proof rule again, it will acquire the... Um, location, the single location invariant at exactly that value, which is going to be non-zero, uh, so either false or what we want to have, which we can reduce to just exactly non-atomic ownership of X. So we do that. We, are, we acquire this ownership here. And finally, when we now perform the non-atomic read, we are guaranteed to get the correct value of 37. Now, what I want you to notice is that this proof is really nice and it has no views at all. They're completely gone. And this is awesome. So um, let's, let's look now at how we encode this logic on top of our base logic with all these views. And um, it, the trick turns out to be rather simple. Um, we use what we call monotone view predicates to encode ISL assertions. And the, the um, important bit here, I shouldn't say, the important bit here is that uh, our assertions need to be monotone in views because every step in the operational semantics might uh, upgrade your view to a bigger view. Right, so to achieve stability of our assertions, the monotonicity is really uh, key here. So I'm, I'm showing you here just a, a bit of the encoding from ISL assertions to IRIS assertions. Uh, and for the most part, it's, it's very it's structural, uh, very straightforward, like you can see here with the separating conjunction. We just thread through the views. Uh, what's more interesting, though, is the encoding of Hodge ripples, where, um, well, first of all, we have to put in this extra bit for monotonicity. Well, it's not, okay, that, that's fine. Uh, but second of all, we, we were going to thread through the scene assertion that, that I've shown you earlier uh, throughout the entire execution of every hot triple. Um, and we can see here that we demand that the uh, view uh, grows after, after every step. It, it never shrinks. This is crucial. So the good news is that this encoding is not just for ISL. It also works for GPS. Um, GPS is, is kind of a successor of ISL, a more powerful logic. Um, I don't have time to introduce it to you. But what I want you to know is that we also encode GPS, and in fact, we do more. We extend GPS with very useful proof rules. And one of the highlights of the, of the paper is the so-called single writer rule, which is a very strong write rule in, uh, in the absence of, of write-write races. Uh, and in fact, we have found that write-write races are extremely rare in our examples, in all the examples we looked at. And this rule dramatically simplifies the proofs and, and shortens the, the, the number of lines we need to make our examples work. Um, and I just want you, want you to know that uh, adding these extensions to the logic was made super easy by using Iris. So prototy prototyping new rules just corresponds to doing a bunch of separation logic proofs, which is absolutely amazing. Right, so uh, let's see, what else is in the paper? Um, we have the, the full model of Iris and IGPS assertions as monotone view predicates. Uh, we also deal with allocation and deallocation. We have um, a bunch of additional extensions that I don't have time to talk about. And uh, finally, we mechanized uh, ver the, the verification of, of a number of examples, all the examples we could find in previous work, circular buffers, bounded ticket logs, Michael Scott Q, uh, and many more. Um, and finally, also, recently, the read-copy-update algorithm that is used in the, in the Linux kernel. Uh, and all of this is verified in COC. Okay, so um, I'm going to leave you uh, again with this picture of our project. Uh, I just want to say uh, a, a few sentences about future work. Um, so one thing we want to do is we want to take all of this and, uh, and rebase it on 
a stronger operation in semantics that cover a larger fragment of the C11 memory model, or really the, the, the full C11 memory model, if possible. So we're going to try to use these, these so-called promising semantics that were introduced at Popple this year um, and then kind of rebuild all these logics. Uh, and, and secondly, we would like to integrate all of this into the ongoing work on formalizing the Rust type system. And that's it from me. Thank you. All right, this is very nice. Uh, could you please switch to the slide 22 again? 22, you went yeah. over it too quickly. Yes. Ah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So the so the semantics of the of the last of the last statement, mm -hmm. where the thread IDs come from. Mm -hmm. So does it mean that the semantic is defined for a fixed number of threads per program? No, no. Or? Uh, it's not a fixed number of threads. It's it's simply the case that um, in our current setup we need to always mention the thread ID. That's, that's not a technical lim limitation, it's just the way we started the project and we never changed it. But it's not, it, it's really, we have a, a fork construct in the language, you can always create new threads, um, if that, that answers your question. So the semantics axiomatizes the creation of fresh thread IDs somehow? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's part of it, of course, yes. All right, okay, so and I have a second question. So Iris uh, made a big deal out of the abstract atomicity uh, ah, and yes, I didn't yes. see any of that in your talk. Yes, so. uh, we haven't actually done that yet. Um, it's still ongoing research to find out if, if this works just as well with, with these kind of semantics. Um, I would say it does, but it's not clear yet. But we definitely want to look at that. All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Thank you for giving um, what looked to me like a clear enough explanation of a complex uh, situation. <laughs> I've you. got two questions. The first thing is I explained to myself that the reason you want, you are able to get rid of the views uh, when you reason about uh, uh, the, this pattern is that uh, you, s you have predicates that say, by the time I reach a certain instruction, I know that something else will have happened. This is mm -hmm. what your predicate uh, that said yes. that was. Um, so the, the que first question is, is that a, a correct explanation? My second question is, were you able to get rid of the views because you have not considered all possible access modes? And when you do all the access modes, then... Uh, it, it will not be possible anymore. Uh, by exit modes, you mean other fragments of C11? Or, um... You showed us that there are four... Oh, yeah, uh, non-atomics release yes, and acquire. Yes, I mean, yeah. th these are all the access modes we have in, in these particular fragments, which just release acquire and non-atomics. Um, but, but there are more modes, I think, yeah? Not in... in... Yes, so the full C11 model also has relaxed accesses, for example. Um, and. This is, is part of the future work with the, the promising semantics. We, we think we can also get rid of the views there. The interaction with the views is much more interesting then, but um, they, they should all vanish eventually. Uh, now, the first part of your question, so remind me again, I think I already forgot it. Were you able to, uh, the mechanism through which you get rid of the views is because you introduce uh, um, predicates that say that by the time I have reached a yes, certain yes, yes. position in my own thread, something, uh, some effect will have happened. Yes, that, that is what we do. And that seems to cover all the... I mean, it definitely covers both RSI and GPS, which currently are really the only logics available for, for, for this, this fragment of C11. Um, the, the same thing will also, I think, extend to the, uh, the relaxed accesses. I mean, this, this general pattern of um, defining the high-level contract, uh, constructs in terms of uh, what I usually call a, a, a bit of, of ghost ownership and then something about the views. This is, this is the, the general pattern, and it just seems to work out as far as I can tell. I don't have any, any like deeper insight into why exactly it works, uh, but I can say it's a very, very nice encoding. It's very nice to work with. 